<laughs> See, that's good. That's good. Tell, you guys are good. Tell the truth in the dangerous business. All right, see, you got it. <laughs> this week's parasha, considered by the Talmud as perhaps the most important one in the Torah. Believe it or not, that's just the opinion of the Talmud. Is named after Yitro or Jethro. And of course, we know that that is Moshe's father in law. Which, of course, begs the question, because that's what I do, I set you up for questions here. Why did Yitro merit such honorable mention in the Talmud? Well, because the rabbinical writers viewed Yitro as one who searched for and declared truth. Searched for and declared truth. They believed also that he had held a prestigious position as one of Pharaoh's advisors. Now, again, I don't want to go too deep in this because you're thinking that I'm making the Talmud authoritative. We know there's a lot of extra biblical sources that help to at least attempt to fill in the gaps, okay? Doesn't mean they're right. It's, when it's outside the Bible, it's speculative. But this is an opinion of the rabbinical writers in the, in the Talmud. Now, the Midrash about this portion states that about in the 130th year of Israel's captivity in Egypt, Pharaoh had a dream. And Pharaoh dreamed that while sitting on the throne, he saw an old man before him holding a scale in his hands. And on one side of the scale were all the elders, all the nobles, all the great honored men of Egypt at the time. And on the other side of the balance was a, uh, a single sheep that outweighed all the great Egyptians. So that one sheep was outweighing all the, the great and powerful men of Egypt. That was his dream. And disturbed by this dream, wasn't really sure what to do with it, <laughs> Pharaoh woke early in the morning and he summoned all his advisors and wise men to help him interpret the dream. And among those summoned were Bill Yom, and you might know him in his English name as Balaam, the son of Or, the great Gentile prophet, and of course there was Yitro or Jethro, the future father-in-law of Moshe, and finally there was Job, Job, a great man of faith, who refused to curse God despite his profound losses and suffering that he endured. The Midrash also depicts Bilyam as spewing venomous hate towards the Jewish people, advising Pharaoh that a male child will soon be born to the Israelites, who will destroy the entire land of Egypt and lead all the Hebrews out of the country. Amazing, that's in the Talmud, isn't it? He advises Pharaoh to take radical action against these Hebrews. So at Bilyam's insistence, Pharaoh then asked Jethro, and Job for their opinions. We all have them, right? So Yitro spoke up immediately, countering totally William's advice. Instead, cautioning Pharaoh to don't come against the Hebrews. Don't do it. Not prudent. And he, he advised him drawing on the recent legend or experiences of Abraham, of Yitzhak, of Jacob, and he warned Pharaoh that any leader who had, in the past, confronted the Hebrews, they were met with a bitter end. Well, instead of embracing this truth, Pharaoh was angered. He was angered by Jethro's advice, and he dismissed him in disgrace. And so Yitro left, Mitzrayim, and he headed out to the desert to Midian. And of course, you know how the story follows up. And that's where Moses met him in the wilderness. Now, in commenting on today's parasha Yitro, a rabbinical writer, Rabbi Shlomo Wolby, expresses this. And hear me when I say this. Quoting the rabbi, this parasha is named Yitro to teach us that the way to acquire Torah is to follow the ways of Yitro. Search for the truth and be critical. Reject falsehood. And when you discover truth, 
Be ready to sacrifice everything for it. Not too long ago, one of your fellow congregants came to me, just doing casual conversation, was curious why so many people seem to come and go so much in the congregation. And I didn't really have an immediate answer for him. I should as a rabbi, but I didn't. But I reflected on it a little bit. <clears throat> I reflected on the families that had left, individuals too, and the Holy Spirit led me to identify a common denominator for every congregant's exodus. I realized that really at the center of it all was a hatred of me for speaking the truth. A hatred of me speaking the truth. For example, when I approached the parents of an overly flirtatious daughter early on in our ministry, parents didn't appreciate that. They actually got angry and they left. When I confronted a couple who were undermining the vision of the congregation many years back with a very orthodox Jewish doctrine, they were angry. And so I agree they took two-thirds of the congregation in alignment with them. When I confronted the fiancé of a couple in the midst of my marital counseling about derogatory comments that she was making about her future groom, they both became angry and left to be married by another pastor just weeks later. Because there's a lot of pastors out there who just marry whoever, whenever. When I was approached by a couple to perform their wedding after being engaged for just a few weeks, the future groom having just moved out from living with another woman, I said no. And angry, they departed for another Messianic congregation, of course, when they were immediately married by that rabbi and pastor. When I taught that there was just but one Torah for Jew and Gentile, well, that angered the Messianic movement leaders. Of course, I don't have a relationship with them anymore. When I taught that we are to eat kosher, that we are actually intended by design to be vegetarian and eat a Genesis diet, well, of course, some are very angered by that and left. When I taught that uh, living together before marriage was sin, people were, guess what, angered by that and left. When I taught that the Torah allows only for male leadership and that female pastors and rabbis were strictly unbiblical, guess what happened? People were angry and left. When I taught that we are to dress appropriately on Shabbat, to bring your best on Shabbat, that there were actually priestly garments that were special and set apart, guess what happened? People were angry and left. When I taught that we are not to come to Beit El, not to come to the house of God empty-handed, well, people were convicted, offended, and, of course, you know what happened? What they do? When I taught that the prosperity gospel is heresy, some disagreed and... When I taught that Muhammad is a false prophet and Islam is a religion of hate, I saw people angered and they walked out. When I taught that homosexuality is sin as a same-sex marriage, people were offended in. When I taught that there's not going to be any rapture on the blood moon, nor does the Bible support any pre-trib rapture, guess what happened? Congregants were angry in. When I taught that this scripture does not support cremation, but instead burial, guess what happened? People were angry in. They left. When I defended the divinity of Yeshua, people thinking less of him, left. And when I exposed the truth that Yeshua was not born December 25th, nor does the Torah instruct us to celebrate his birth, and further that Christmas is a man-made day and nowhere to be found in scriptures, guess what happened? Families were angered and left. And finally, when I declared the Messiah of the church is not the Messiah of the Torah, 
and therefore a false messiah, guess what happened? People were angry and... And probably have to say all that, half of you won't be here next time. <laughs> I'm here every Shabbat. Amen. Somehow the Lord seems to support that and keep providing for us. Yes. Rabbi Shavuot opens his letter to Galatia, from which our Bricha portion is taken, in chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, <clears throat> describing their perverted state. Quoting, I am astounded that you are so quick to remove yourselves from me. Come astounded by how quick you are to remove yourself from me, the one who called you by the Messiah's grace, and to turn to some other supposed good news, which is not good news at all. And what is really happening is that certain people are pestering you and trying to pervert the genuine good news of the Messiah. See, in Shaul's concern and anxiety for them, he asked them then, in Galatians 4.16, our Brich portion, Have I now become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Have I become your enemy because I'm going to tell you the truth today? I am not politically correct. In case you're a little confused. And so like Rabbi Shaul, I present you this morning a truth. That we are apt to cut our ties with and dislike those who have the courage and the conviction to tell us the truth. Especially when it regards sin in our lives. And as we were reminded of last Shabbat from 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, everyone who keeps sinning is doing what? Sister, violating Torah. Indeed, the scripture says, sin is violation of the very thing that supposedly was nailed to the cross and done away with. So if you have a problem with that doctrine, you'll probably get angry and you will leave. <laughs> We don't like people to be acquainted with our shortcomings and our faults. We really don't want to share that with people. We prefer to be flattered. But shrink away when our sin is exposed and we are called to teshuvah or repent. We often become easily offended when the rabbi exposes our rebellion and challenges us towards change. One of the greatest difficulties is to regard with steady and unwavering affection the person who earnestly tells us the truth. Yeah, the painful truth. Wounds from a friend are received as well meant, but an enemy's kisses are insincere, says the writer of Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. Brothers and sisters of God, I got another truth to tell you. Sometimes we need to be rebuked. Sometimes we need a good rebuke. And that might surprise you, or this might surprise you, that most of the Bruch HaShah, or the New Testament, was written specifically, and hear me, not to only get you rich, or to instruct you on how to live right, or to encourage you to make you feel better, much of the New Testament, or the Brich HaDashah, was written to rebuke you. To rebuke us, people of the way. There are several examples, more than this setting today will allow me to cite, and more than you probably want to hear. But there are several examples where people had to rebuke one another to save them from sin. Keith or Peter rebuked Shimon or Simon in Acts 8. Shaul or Paul rebuked Kephar or Peter to his face in Galatians 2. Yochanan or John called Diotrephes by name and exposed the sin he committed. I don't do that. I don't call you by name. Paul did. Or John, 
and John did. He called him out by name and exposed the sin to everyone. And third John chapter 1. Shalom or Paul told his Padawan learner, Timothy, to rebuke elders and others who continue in sin that the rest may fear. And throughout the Torah, there are multiple examples showing that the preaching of the truth of God's word often creates enemies. Just two Shabbats ago, two parashot ago, Moshe was truthful to Pharaoh, but Pharaoh hated him, hated him for saying it. What did Pharaoh say? Get away from me! And you had better not see my face again, because the day you see my face, you will die. And Moshe's response, well spoken. I will see your face no more. And how about Jezebel? I've met her. Who hated Eliyahu, or Elijah, because he mocked and exposed her false prophets. Herod and Herodias hated the truth so vehemently that they had Yochanan or John the Immerser or Baptist beheaded for telling them the truth. The enemies of Yeshua feared the truth so much that they bribed the soldiers to lie. King Ahab or Ahab said to the prophet Micha, I hate him. I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. What's up with that? I want to hear good. Isn't that why you come to Shabbat? I want to hear a happy message. I want to hear a feel-good message. I want to hear about healing and money and grace and love. What are you rebuking me for? I'll go to that big place that has the, all the flashing lights and comfortable seats. If you preach Torah truth over church doctrine, you will be hated. You will be hated. And very few people are honest to say, oh, I actually didn't like the rabbi because he told me the truth. Not even say that. No. Instead, you'll hypocritically attribute your dislike to me with some contrived reason. It'll make something up. Maybe. Isaiah says that people in his day said, do not tell us the visions you have as they really are. No, no, no. Flatter us. And I'm quoting scripture. Flatter us. Fabricate illusions. Fabricate some illusions so we feel good. No matter what time in history, this cry has been heard over and over and over again. Humankind's efforts to conform God to our image instead of our conforming to the image of God continues. It's alive and well. And people generally have fought the truth. And there's probably two reasons. There's two prominent reasons why people fight the truth. The first is that some have been unconscious about the enemies of the truth. In other words, they fight God and his will ignorantly. They don't know that they're doing it. They honestly think that they're okay with the Lord and that they're living godly, holy, set apart lives. And they are bewildered by any consideration that perhaps... The life that you think you're living, the godly life that you think you're living, is actually in contrast to what the Torah really desires for you. So you live delusionally. Rabbi Shaul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, did so, but he sought truth. He embraced truth. And by seeking truth and being honest with his heart, about his, 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 his real, his, the spirit of his heart, he did find the truth later, and he renounced his error, and he embraced the truth. And that's not an easy thing to do. That's not an easy thing to do, to be honest with yourself about your motives and your intent and your spirit when you are confronted with a truth about you or about what you believe and how you respond to it. And if you're honest, as Rabbi Shaul was, you had that opportunity to do as he did, and that's renounce your error and embrace the truth. <clears throat> in fact, Rabbi Shaul shared these words in his second letter 
to the congregation at Thessalonica. He said, those who do not love the truth will remain blinded in their ignorance and error. The second reason that men fight the truth is that, well, because we love darkness. We love darkness. Oh, that's not true. Oh, it is. Because it covers your evil deeds. Yeshua said, I mean, you, you, if you disagree with me, you're disagreeing with the Lord. Because Yeshua said, now, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light. Why? Said Yeshua, because their actions were wicked. Spiritual creatures of darkness despise the light. Their deeds are evil and sinful, and therefore they don't want to hear the truth. It makes no difference, though, because no matter how much the truth is opposed, it will nevertheless survive. Truth will always survive. <clears throat> so Shaul's question and the context of Galatians 4 confirms the fact that truth, and hear me, truth must be be declared no matter what. Truth must be declared no matter what, even at the expense of making enemies. And I can tell you how many times I've come to that crossroad of having to express a truth. Every Shabbat, I feel that way. Don't you think that I know when I come to this beam or this pulpit that I know that something I'm going to say will be an offense? I know that. As I'm as I am penning the words, I immediately am thinking, somebody's not going to like this. The truth is, our most valuable commodity in existence today is truth, because it is a re revelation from God which can save us from our sins. Absolutely. That's right. By truth. We are advised in Proverbs 23. If you could buy it, buy it. Buy truth. And do not sell it. Also buy wisdom, discipline, and discernment. That's what Proverbs 23 tells us. If you have a compromising uh, attitude towards error, and I hear that a lot, those things that we want to hold on to. Well, God is a gracious God, and he'll go along with me on this one. He won't beat me up on this one. That's not a big deal to God. What is that? That's compromise. That's a compromising attitude. You're conforming God into your image. You're getting God to submit to your will rather than you submit to God's will. So... If you have a compromising attitude towards error, you are on the road to apostasy. You are on the road to apostasy. And Paul, Rabbi Shaul, details some steps towards apostasy when he was talking to uh, Timothy in his second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verses 3-4. through four. The first step he described was that they, the people would not endure sound doctrine. They would not endure sound doctrine. That's an attitude of compromise. They will accumulate for themselves certain teachers who will proclaim agreed upon ideas of truth. In other words, he's preaching what I believe. Right? Have you said that looking for a congregational home? Well, that guy preaches what I believe. So as long as he preaches what you believe, then you'll continue to be there. And the moment he preaches something, at least challenges you something biblically, that is counter to what you believe, well, that's time to go. It's time to find another pastor or a rabbi that preaches what I believe. That's the road to apostasy. That's right? Because you haven't submitted to the spiritual authority of the rabbi. You haven't put your faith or your confidence in his leadership and his teaching. All you're waiting on is for him to align himself to you, and as long as he's validating your point of view every Shabbat, then all is well. But the moment I deviate from your point of view, then it's time to move on. Am I wrong? That's what has happened 
to the body of Messiah in these days. Go back 40, 50 years, you go into the service, you sit down, what the pastor says is gospel. Because that's when you put your faith and hope and confidence in this man of God that was called. But it's changed. You will not endure sound doctrine. Rabbi Shaul called it having your ears tickled. The second step towards apostasy is that they turn their ears away from the truth, not only refusing to hear the truth, but in time rejecting the whole counsel of God. And really beyond that, the final stage of that whole process is taking place today because it's not only rejecting God, now we are turning around and going after God. Or rebelling against God. Yes. Scripture talks about it's a sign of the times. It's one thing just to, you know, reject God. Ah, that's not for me. Right. And that, that church stuff and that God says, not for me. I have my own set of beliefs. No way of doing things. <laughs> and you kind of let it go. But the final step, to, like the, you know, the proverbial nail in the coffin for our souls, is when we turn around, humanity turns around, and starts going, no, no, no. In fact, I'm going after him. I'm going to challenge this doctor. I'm going to challenge God in this. I'm taking them on. That's where we're at today. And you look at it, every aspect of our culture and society today, it's about coming after God and his people. That's where we're at. And then the final step towards apostasy is you turn aside to myths. All truth now is eliminated from your life. You just believe the myths. It's urgent that we realize these trends towards apostasy in the body of Messiah that we continue to experience and we have intimately at the start. You know, one common expression of compromise is this statement. I know you've heard it. And I mentioned this to pastors who've had their elders take them aside and say, look, we got to keep our numbers up. Just preach the Bible. Yeah. And let everyone else alone. Just preach Bible. Let everyone alone. Every true student of the scriptures knows that this is impossible. It's impossible. You would have, for example, you would have to shun preaching the creation of the world of life. So we'd have to throw out Genesis all together. Because everybody's bought into the theory of evolution. Theory. We certainly don't want to upset the atheists and the evolutionists. We would have to avoid preaching the ten words or ten commandments that were revealed in today's parasha for fear of irritating the polytheistic pagan. Of course, we'd have to forego the preaching pleasing God through our faith for fear of annoying those whose lies are controlled by their own personal convictions and conscience. It's like a police officer ordering you to shoot, but make sure you don't hit anybody. Shoot your gun, just don't hit anybody. Okay? You don't want anybody wounded. You want them happy. Several years ago, an elder of a congregation said, the trouble here is our preacher is a professional ball player. He winds up on Sunday morning and throws a curve around everybody in the house. Doesn't hit anybody. If I'm preaching the truth every Shabbat, brother, sister, expect I'm going to hit one or more of you with it. It's going to happen. I throw the ball. Now we desperately need in these days Torah observant Messiah like men who will break unto us, the scripture says, the bread of life and deliver the whole counsel of God. It's impossible to teach the truth of Torah and not step on somebody's toes. I can't do it. To lead souls to salvation, to mature our congregational witness and prepare saints for eternal life in heaven, teaching the whole Torah must take place. <coughs> Secondly, another common sentiment today is don't preach a negative gospel. 
Well, I failed that one today. <laughs> how can we not preach a negative gospel? How do you, how, how is that possible? This thinking indicts God himself because he didn't always deliver a positive message to his prophets of Tom and Eve. And I'm not promoting being negative. But again, if you're going to preach the whole counsel of God, at times it is negative. A careful study of our portion today will show eight of the Ten Commandments are stated in a negative fashion. Rabbi Shaul said, I solemnly charge you before God the Messiah Yeshua, who will judge the living and the dead when he appears and establishes his kingdom, proclaim the word. Be on hand with it, whether the time seems right or not. And then he says, convict, censor, exhort with unfailing patience and with teaching. Guess what? Two of those three commands were what? Negative. Negative. In naming the works of the flesh. What does Rabbi Shaul say? He mentions 17 negatives. In naming the fruit of the Spirit. We all love that one. Rabbi Shaul mentions nine positives out of the whole lot. Only nine. And of course, of course, I'm not saying here today we're not supposed to preach positive truths of the gospel. Of course we need encouraging lessons which comfort us in difficult times, which helps us understand God's love and grace and which aids us in becoming better servants of Yeshua. Of course! Of course we need to know we are doing God's will correctly and are encouraged in doing that. But we also need preaching on adultery. This congregation was split because of adultery. We need preaching on fornication. Of course, none of you are guilty of that here today. Good thing. We need teaching on gambling. I know none of you bought you know, the Powerball ticket. We need teaching on smoking. Not no smokers here, are there? We need teaching on gluttony. Being that two-thirds of the pastors are fat anyway, they aren't going to touch that one. We need teaching on hatred. We need teaching on envy. We need teaching on drunkenness. We need teaching on congregational discipline. We need teaching on immodest apparel. I never forget. True story. When we were down in the corner, you remember this one, didn't we? We were down in the corner, and this couple was coming, the little girl, and every time she comes, she wore really low pants. And so when she sat in her chair, her cracker butt was always sticking out. Did I say that? And the people sitting behind her, you know, like three, four rows back, are looking at the rear end of this girl, you know? So I had to say something. And of course, you know what happened? What? They got angry and. We got to teach respect for authority. There's a final attitude of compromise. Let's please the people instead of worrying about getting them saved. Let's get them in the door. Let's get, let's, let's lower the bar. Let's accommodate them where they're at. Let's fill the house and maybe at some point they might be interested in understanding what the, the path to salvation is all about, the, what salvation is. Don't worry about that now. Please the people. Tell them what they want to hear. Shaul's statement to the Galatian congregation, I'm going to read it for you. And it needs to be imprinted upon your heart. Paul, Rabbi Shaul, was a straight shooter. And that's why a lot of people are trying to undermine the authority of Rabbi Shaul's scriptures that are contained in the Brick of Shah. Because they don't like him. You know why I don't like him? Because he preaches truth. You know what happens when he preached true? And that's, rabbi, that's exactly what Rabbi Shaul did. This is what he says. Now, does that sound as if I were trying to win human approval? No. I want God's approval. Or that I'm trying to cater to people? 
people, if I were still doing that, I would not be a servant of the Messiah. Here it is. Either you're catering to the people or you're catering to God. That's a choice that a rabbi or a pastor has to make. And that's why a lot of people who stand in this beam or pulpit are doing it as a job. And when they do it as a job, then the way that you have a successful job is that the house is filled. And you do whatever it takes to please the people so they come pay their tithes and offerings and you get to play golf twice a week. Which I don't get to do, Bill! <laughs> that's your story. <laughs> He's always calling me up and saying, where are you out in the golf course? <laughs> Does it sound like I'm trying to win your approval today? No. Or does it sound like I'm trying to win God's approval? Yeah. Pleasing people has caused a steady moral and spiritual decline in our nation and in the kingdom of God today. Right. Isn't that what politics are all about? Yeah. Why do you think so many people are gravitating towards Donald Trump? And I'm not endorsing him from the pulpit, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer to a phenomenon. <coughs> Because he's definitely like, he's stretching the imagination of people pleasure. Okay? And so what comes out of his candidacy is that people are just tired of politics and they want some truth. And they're willing to take his lack of uh, social skills in order to find that truth. But don't be deceived either. Denominational churches today. Just ask Mary Lou, who was in the Presbyterian Church for what, 65 years? 76 years. 76 years she was in the Presbyterian Church. Why is she here? Well, that's part of it. Too. She's here because denominational churches today allow for homosexual pastors. Denominational churches now allow adulterers. They now allow heretics to fill their pulpits and proclaim a saving gospel while their souls are condemned to hell. The religious world today is in this mad race to see which one can make religion the most palatable to the public. How can we water it down and kind of work it out so that it fits all? It's a one size fits all kind of thing. I think they call that the New World Order. I think that's what it is. So look, I'm going to wrap this up, believe it or not. Brothers and sisters, I am convinced that if we do not see strength in our preaching and teaching that is more Torah-centered, that is more spirit-filled and Messiah-like, the body of Messiah will be nothing more than an empty religious powerless shell. But we all need to, like Kohelet, who expressed in Ecclesiastes, we all need to work to develop an attractive writing style in which we can express, like he did, the truth straightforwardly. See, the disastrous consequences of not doing so will be lost souls. And we will all be guilty and held accountable for those lost souls. Lost souls at the judgment seat of Messiah Yeshua. It is so shameful to hear, to hear of and see so many preachers that are fired or ostracized for proclaiming the truth. And you've seen it so many times. I've seen it here. They'll come in, they'll visit one or two times, the Holy Spirit is drawing them, they're starting to sort of come to this crossroads of OMG. And, and many of us have been on that road of revelation, and often it's a process of revelation. Whether you come out of the Nazarene church, or whether you come out of independent congregations, or Presbyterian church, or wherever you come out of, there was that defining moment where you had that aha, and it's like, wait a minute. I missed it. How did I miss it? And some of you are still in that process. Some of you got one foot in and one foot out. And I just have to say I rebuke that. Yeah. The 
the Lord rebukes that. Because then you're as wishy-washy as the waves of the sea. That's right. But there are pastors who come to this revelation. And when they start to bring this revelation to their pulpits, when they come and say, Brethren, the Holy Spirit has spoken to me, and in my study of the Word of God today, I realized it's Sunday morning that really we've made a sin. That the Sabbath is Saturday. Amen. And starting next week, we're worshiping on the Sabbath, on the Lord's Day, Amen. on Shabbat. Amen. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? You know why it's funny? That guy's going to be looking for a job in a couple days. Right, right. Or he's going to get a whole lot of phone calls and texts and emails. Yeah, he will. Yeah, he will. Because that event will expose several issues. One, of course, no submission to spiritual authority. And two, no submission to God's authority, His Word. And that's what happens when, to these pastors... These rabbis, when they begin to align their teaching and preaching to the Torah, they become either ostracized or fired. And it's even more shameful to see congregations and their elders unwilling to support the rabbi or pastor and stand with him on the truth. Yes, telling the truth can be a dangerous business. And so dangerous, you may very well be hated for it, as Paul declared in our portion this morning from Galatians 4.16. King David understood this. He understood it as one who revealed he was taunted. He was taunted for doing so. But nevertheless... According to scripture, David kept trusting Torah. He kept trusting Torah, calling upon Hashem, the scripture says, to not take away the power you've given me to speak the truth. Amen. Don't take that away, Lord. That's right. Especially in days like these, we all need to be like Yitro. We all need to continue to search for Declare the truth regardless of the cost. Regardless of the cost. Someone once said, and I'm going to close this line, maybe, please rise. Someone once said, and hear me when I tell you this, it's a profound statement. The only people mad at you for speaking the truth are those people who are living a lie. The only people mad at you for speaking the truth are those people who are living a lie. Brothers and sisters, I only have really one closing statement to make. Keep speaking. Father, in Yeshua's name, we thank you, Lord, that your word has gone forth this morning. We thank you, Father, that obviously your Holy Spirit has impressed upon us all to protect the truth. That there's nothing more valuable in this world than truth. Because, Father, in truth is our salvation, is our hope. If we don't believe the truth, then we have no hope. And you, what's the truth? Yeshua. The way he lived his life, what he taught... Father, the work on the tree. If we don't believe the truth of Yeshua, we are lost. And we've seen so many, Father, come through our doors, Lord, who have been angered by the truth. And Father, so they've gone and they've listened now to a different gospel. And they are lost. Their hearts go out to them. We've seen so many brothers and sisters go back from whence they came. Father, we can only hope and pray that, Father, as in children, what we have planted, Father, when they're older, won't depart from them. Because so many of us, Father, are really children of the faith. 
Lord, we all know that, Father, following you is a work. It's a priestly work. And we as a priesthood of believers must continue to press on towards the mark. And Father, whether we are loved or not, certainly Yeshua wasn't for the truth. We saw what happened to him. We saw what happened to his most intimate followers, his dominee. What happened to them? It comes at a price, Father. We will be ostracized. No, Paul had it right. We will be hated. But that's okay. That's okay. Because, Father, we're here to please you, not people. So we thank you again for this word, this day. Father, bless our remaining time of fellowship. Pray for those, Father, who are struggling or hurting right now. And pray for those, Father, who are with us because of illness. And Father, those who have been deceived, Father, drawn to false gospels and doctrines, Father, bring the light of Yeshua. Take them out of the darkness. Reveal the truth to them once again and bring them back. We pray these things in Yeshua's name the congregation says. Amen. Adonai Panavalecha Vichanecha Adonai Panavalecha Bissim Lecha Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And I pray the Lord would lift his counts upon you and that he would grant you his peace his shalom, and most importantly, his truth. Hashem Yeshua Adonai and the congregation agrees. Amen.